of the, the national report and then the findings in Texas, and then we'll hear from our other panelists about the response to that and how it fits into the larger context. So in 2012, the NAACP and our partners, the Indigenous Environmental Justice, the Indigenous Environmental Network and the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization released the Cold-Blooded Report, which detailed the harms being wrought on communities of color and low-income communities by the burning of coal. Um, in terms of both the direct environmental health impacts through coal's leading contribution to, and through coal's leading contribution to the global progression towards catastrophic climate change. And in, in, here in Texas in 2010, fossil fuel-based energy accounted for 92% of the total energy consumed in Texas. In spite of its abundant in-state clean energy potential, at $1.85 billion in expenditures, Texas spent the most out of 50 states in the nation on coal imports in 2012. Texas produced 34.9% of net electricity generated in the state in September of 2013 from coal. Texas has five coal plants that received a failing environmental justice grade in the 2012 Cold-Blooded Report. And as we know, coal-based energy, electricity energy generation is proven to be unhealthy to humans and the environment, and therefore has hidden economic and other costs. Texas is also seeing the impacts of climate change firsthand, including the increase in the frequency and severity of extreme weather events and shifts in agricultural yield. Given the nation's historical, historic reliance on coal as the largest source for electricity production and the harms of other fossil fuel-based energy production processes, through our findings, we at the NAACP have identified energy production through uh, fossil fuel-based energy as a clear civil rights issue. We then signal the need to transition from coal and other fossil fuel-based energy production processes to an aggressive emphasis on energy efficiency and clean energy policies and practices. We know that it's communities of color and low-income communities that spend the highest proportion of our income on electricity. Out of 50 states plus the District of Columbia, Texas ranks 11th in the list of states where ratepayers spent the highest proportion of income on electricity in 2012. And those rate costs are coupled with health care costs, lost days of school, lost days of work, which are disproportionately borne by the communities that host the polluting facilities. Therefore, investing wisely with an emphasis on sustainability, health, and local economic development and affordability is essential. Using data primarily from the U.S. In, in, in Energy Information Agency, the American Council for the Energy Efficient Economy, and the database for state incentives for renewable energy, and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the NAACP's National Just Energy Policies Report documents the current state of our energy choices and our energy policy landscape. More importantly, the report details both the potential for greater energy efficiency and use of clean energy, as well as the policy pathways for capitalizing on this potential. To this end, with the history of established NAACP positions on energy, environmental justice, and climate change dating back to 1977, the NAACP has developed a set of standards pertaining to three key policies in the energy landscape, which, if implemented aggressively, could improve health, well-being, and economic, the economic conditions of communities nationwide. So we are recommending a renewable portfolio standard for each state that is mandatory and ensures that the state gets at least 25% of its energy from renewable sources, with a focus on solar, wind, and geothermal forces. We're recommending an energy efficiency resource standard that is mandatory and has a target of 2% annual reduction over each previous year's um, retail electricity sales. We're also recommending a net metering policy that, gener that guarantees that ratepayers can have at least 2,000 kilowatt capacity limits for their individual solar, wind, or geothermal system. So they can sell back to the utility any excess of electricity they generate above what they use. Furthermore, out of recognition of the fact that the American Association of Blacks and Energy found that in 2009, African Americans spent 20, 50, $40 billion on energy, had 1.1% of energy jobs, and gained less than 1% of revenue from the energy sector, we identified energy as an economic justice issue. These statistics demonstrate that not only are African Americans not part of the decision making for our energy choices, but we're, all, and we, but we're also disproportionately experiencing harm from energy production processes and getting a trace amount of the economic benefits from the energy sector. These figures are also similar for other communities of color, including Latino and Native American, um, as well as low-income communities. With the energy sector being a trillion dollar in industry, there is great opportunity if we make the transition to greater energy efficiency and to clean energy. If electric utilities
utilities fulfill just 20% of their electric sales through renewable energy by 2020, 1.9 million jobs can be generated across the United States. By 2030, an estimated 20% of U.S. electricity will be provided by wind power, and the solar power industry is projected to become a $15 billion industry by 2020. Therefore, we recommend that each state establish local hire provisions that, com com that means that companies receiving state funding should recruit a specified proportion of local residents as workers on those projects. A lot of times when these projects come to town, they come with a promise of jobs, but often the facilities get built and then the people also bring in the people to work in the facilities and the communities get left out of the, of the economic flow from businesses um, coming in. We also recommend that each state establishes a disadvantaged or minority business enterprise provision, which provides training opportunities, which notifies minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses of business opportunities, and which has a set, set of state set-aside funds for minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses. In addition to individual entrepreneurship and small business development, we also encourage community economic development models, such as community-owned energy, and we've heard kind of community-owned solar schemes, and we recommend that. The good news is that overall we're on our way down the just energy path. According to our report, we found that 29 states and the District of Columbia already have mandatory renewable portfolio standards and eight states have voluntary standards. 20 states have mandatory energy efficiency resource standards and eight states have voluntary energy efficiency resource standards. 43 states have net metering um, mandatorily and um, three states have voluntary goals. There are only nine states that had explicit local hire provisions within their energy policies, and there were no states that had MBE provisions within their energy policies. So there's a lot that we need to do to really um, make it an economically just um, um, energy policy for our freight community. So in terms of the, the findings in Texas, Texas does have a renewable energy standard. It's um, approximately 8.8% of its energy mix should come from, um, from renewable sources by 2025. But again, we want it to be 25% by 2025, so they have a ways to go to reach that, that goal. They need to triple their current standard. Texas has a voluntary energy efficiency standard that basically slows growth as opposed to actually reducing um, their energy consumption. So we, A, want it to be go, go from voluntary to mandatory, and we want it to be at least 2% reduction over each previous year's electricity. Texas has a voluntary net metering standard, but again, we want it to be a mandatory net metering standard. On the bright side, Texas does have some limited policies that it has incentivized and supported energy efficiency and clean energy, each of which offer limited tax breaks for clean energy and energy efficiency. There are also utility-specific incentives in municipalities such as Austin, Brownsville, Bryan, College Station, Denton, here in Houston, Plano, and elsewhere. However, the NAACP advocates for across-the-board statewide goal-setting in the transition to greater energy efficiency and use of clean energy um, with, 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 so Texas definitely has enough sun, wind, and underground heat to generate all of its electricity, heating, and cooling needs for all residents. Fortunately, Texas is now the leading state for wind generation with over 22% of the nation's installed wind capacity. So that's pretty good. It also ranks first nationally for wind generation potential due to its plentiful wind resources from the Great Plains and also along the Gulf Coast. So, we definitely see that there is there's a potential there. Texas is one of the places that doesn't have a local hire provision and it doesn't have a disadvantaged business enterprise potential, I mean, um, provision for minority women-owned businesses for energy. It has it for the Department of Transportation, but not for, for energy. So we want to see more of those economic um, opportunities also for women-owned businesses and for local workers. So that pretty much sums up kind of where we are in terms of the national report, how Texas sits within that, and where we see that potential is for, for Texas to expand its energy policy. Thank you.